Chapter 13. Let's not be legalistic. Any advertisement or propaganda campaign must contain words or phrases that create pictures in one's mind that elicit certain emotions. Christians are never followers of Jesus Christ. They are fundamentalists or radical religionists. Those that are pro-life are anti-abortion forces. Liberals are progressives. An emotional appeal is a diatribe or rhetoric. These words with the desired response pass through our thoughts with such rapidity that we never really notice the subtle shifts in our beliefs. We as humans are so confident that we make our decisions and form our opinions only from faultless logic that we have become glassy-eyed poultry, simply waiting for the next emotional counterfeit of the truth. And because we as Christians are so confident in our grace-covered, saved state, we believe that our every individual thought, word, and feeling must come directly from the throne of God itself. And because of this, we openly welcome serpentine wisdom as truth and reject the innocence of the dove. We have come to believe, not that we have ever thought we believed it, that our catchwords and phrases are simply truth, and our enemy, the father of propagandas, cannot invade our holy fortress. Jesus, Paul, and Peter must have been mistaken when they urged us to be always on the alert. Satan has quietly and ever so slowly anesthetized the church with false suppositions which have insidiously become accepted as truth, and just as insidiously have been spread by mouth through the body, weakening it in the two areas which must be singularly upheld to distinguish the church from the world surrounding it, unwavering truth and holiness. We have slowly accepted these ideas as the body would accept a virus, fooled into believing that these words are actually a deeper, more humane approach to the truth and will undoubtedly bring good. Haven't we heard it before? You surely shall not die, but your eyes will be opened. One of these words has become so commonly used, has such a ring of tolerance and freedom that it is found in seemingly every Christian's vocabulary, is heard at least once in every doctrinal discussion and many sermons, and is so powerful that it is the final word of doctrinal arguments, immediately placing those to whom it addressed into a dulled stupor of shamed agreement. Yet, it is not a word ever spoken by the Lord Jesus, Moses, Paul, or David. In fact, it is not in the Bible at all. Those who through the centuries have been tortured, imprisoned, and martyred for the faith would have not even understood its lofty but hollow concept. While not in the Bible itself, this word is used most often to negate or combat another word, which is very often found in the Bible, and is at the foundational core of the Christian's understanding of such concepts as Lord, King, Master, Ruler, and All Authority. That word is obedience. It is an uncomfortable word, a word which not only threatens my kingdom, but guarantees its destruction, and as such, must be defended against and rendered a void term. To combat this annoying idea of true obedience to God, Satan has supplied us with a shelter into which we plunge with much relief, the narcotic word legalism, which is our focus here. I have written this chapter because one can already hear the wailing and gnashing of teeth from those who would follow any doctrine if it left them with no responsibility except empty but comfortable ear and ego tickling religion. We desperately and purposefully scuttle the fact that obedience to God and his word, he considers himself and his word as the same entity, John 1.1, 1, 1, is one of the major themes of the Bible. Have we lost the understanding that he is creator? And we are the created, that he is to be honored, obeyed, and glorified, not I, that we were created for his pleasure, not he for ours. Yet we are so quick to discount anyone who dares suggest that we are to obey that which we see in scripture, or who speaks a particular biblical principle that if violated will have certain promised consequences. And the word which is used most often to thwart the innocent inquiry of obedience is legalism. The first problem with the use of the term legalism is that it is more of an undefined concept rather than a concrete term, its definition vague, and therefore its application broad. As such, it can set up its standard at any point, draw the line, wherever convenient. 
But even if we shore up the concept with definition, its application into Christian life is out of place. Webster's new collegiate dictionary defines legalism as a strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to religious or moral code. If we accept this definition, especially when focusing on strict literal, we certainly find who is truly legalistic. God. One of the biggest complaints against Judeo-Christianity is all those do's and don'ts. And even a casual reader of the Bible knows that he appears to be rather insistent on our obeying those do's and don'ts. It gets worse, of course, when we realize that God not only insists on strict and literal conformity to the law, but he is actually the author of the law. Some would have us believe that the God of the Old Testament realized his mistake with this law and obedience thing he was pushing, changed his mind, changed his being, and stepped into a nearby phone booth and emerged as the new and improved God of the New Testament, free from those troubling hang-ups of commandments, laws, and obedience with which he had so struggled. Neither the Old Testament nor the New mentions such an idea. Isaiah 48 states, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Malachi 3.6 tells us, For I, the Lord, do not change. Hebrews 13.8 states, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Matthew 5.17-18, Jesus tells us, Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. All has not been accomplished. Heaven and earth are still here. Jesus doesn't change. God is unchanging. The word stands forever. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. His insistence on obedience to his law has been answered by Jesus' perfect obeying of that law for us. But this substitution, this grace, is for our freedom to obey his will, not for our freedom to disobey as we wish. Ah, but wait, the definition states also excessive conformity. That's it! It's our excessive conformity that irritates us so. But really, our objections become more pitifully weak, no matter how we may shout them, with a simple look at conformity. To conform is to be of the same form. Scripture tells us that we are to become conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8.29. How can we actively be seeking and desiring to be like Christ, and at the same time be actively seeking and desiring to not be excessively like Christ? How does one set up a standard as that to which he will strive to attain, but simultaneously work to not get too close to the standard? We actually have become more fearful of doing something righteous or approving of something righteous than fearing coming close to evil and compromise. No wonder those outside the church focus on our flagrant hypocrisy and mock at the foolishness our life in Christ has become. And if we continue to state that obedience to certain parts of God's word is legalism, which parts do we retain to obey and which parts do we not obey? Where do we draw the line that obedience ends and legalism begins? How close do we get to evil before we say our actions are not legalism? Or how far do we get from righteousness before we are not legalistic? This whole concept is rather preposterous, or should be, to the Christian who claims to follow Christ. The real question to pose to those prone to label others as legalistic is not what actions they define as legalistic, but rather what actions they have decided are not legalism. If we are allowed to draw this line where we wish, we certainly will draw it for our own convenience. Of course, the real problem comes with the fact that we believe we can draw the line at all. For if the line can be drawn arbitrarily, Cannot someone say that it is legalism to believe that Jesus is the only way to eternal life, that one must be born again, that one must be baptized, that we should participate in communion, that we must believe Jesus is the Son of God? And why can we not simply throw out that silliness about the cross and resurrection and remission of sins with the rest of what we consider trite or inconvenient? Remember, we are commanded by God to believe these things. But if obeying God's commandments is legalism, well, 
we don't want to be legalistic. The book of Judges tells us twice that God's people were constantly under judgment because they did what was right in their own eyes. How are we different than they if we decide on our own what words of scripture we will obey and what we won't, what I think applies to my life as opposed to what I consider legalistic? Certainly these are all rhetorical questions, but they do have an answer. We want no one, including God, setting up a standard of behavior for us that we cannot lower, remove, or negate. Which, of course, leaves all standards setting up to us as individuals and must eventually result in no standard of behavior, since every standard established shifts or disappears at our will. Therefore, if we do believe that there is good and evil, light and darkness, truth and lies, righteousness and sin, where do we get these beliefs? And who says what sin is and what is not? We certainly did not get these beliefs from ourselves. Our selfish, murderous ways certainly nullify that notion. The fact is, of course, that the true standard of behavior comes from God in his word, who does not change, nor does his standard of righteousness change. For it is not we, but God the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit who defines sin. A quick look at the book of Romans lets us know that the standard of righteousness and sin has not changed. It remains God's moral law. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. 3.20. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 5.13. Sin is not imputed where there is no law, neither is there violation. 4.5. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. 6.16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, or obedience, resulting in righteousness? We have already seen that Jesus has stated that the entire law stands until heaven and earth pass away. And if that is so, then doing even the smallest jot or tittle of God's word and will is not legalism, but righteous behavior. And to label obedience or a desire of obedience to God as legalism is not righteousness, but compromise. Perhaps we should quickly look at other definitions of legalism, rather than simply the authoritative one from a dictionary. Because you see, as already stated, while the term legalism rings with authority and strength, it actually has no true jurisdiction or single definition. Its definition changes as its user has need, and its jurisdiction covers all standards of behavior, except its own, that of judging others. There are times that our chameleonic catchword assumes the definition of earning salvation by the works of the law. In other words, trusting in your own goodness for salvation, rather than Jesus' sacrifice, righteousness, and grace. Galatians 2.16, as well as the entire Bible, warns against this. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It is obvious that if one is attempting to be justified before God on his own righteous behavior, that it will not work. And if this is legalism, it is certainly wrong in God's eyes. But the question now must be, is this legalism? It certainly does not match our dictionary definition. And as we must admit, scripture does not call it legalism because it never uses the word. The book of Galatians does label such action with other terms, such as transgressor, bewitched, cursed, severed from Christ, and fallen from grace. If this is a spiritual problem, should we not use a spiritual, biblical word for its label? And at least something that is precise and uniform, rather than self-defining and fluctuating. So while this behavior and belief may be many things, and in fact, so many wrong things that it cannot be included in the realm of true Christianity, it cannot be accurately called legalism. But even apart from its non-biblical origin, there are other problems with this definition. The vast majority of the time when the word legalism is used, it is applied to Christians. 
I have known and been known by thousands of Christians in my life, and no matter how poor their grasp of the gospel and doctrine and the Bible, no one has ever expressed to me that their ultimate hope for salvation was not truly and only in Jesus Christ. Many were those whose doctrine and salvation some might question, but the fact remains their hope was in Christ, not in their own righteousness or works. There may be those that call themselves Christian that do not hope in Jesus, but I have met none when truly pressed for their beliefs. But if these exist, they really fit into the category of people who believe the good Lord overlooks our faults and I've lived a good life. They're not legalistic. They're lost. This same argument would continue to hold true even if we again change the definition. This word is so convenient. So, we now will give the definition of trying to live the Christian life in our own strength without relying on the grace of God and Christ in us. Again, this is certainly the wrong way to live as a Christian, and must end, and begin, in failure, and the previous arguments apply here also. But it is not legalism. It is pride. Ephesians 2.8 Not as a result of works that no one should boast. It is foolish. Galatians 3.3 3. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? And it is many other things, but it is not legalism. A closer look at the way legalism is used reveals another interesting flaw in its use. The use of the term is actually the height of hypocrisy. Those that use the term are usually objecting to the fact that some standard of behavior has been set before them. Yet, their use of the term legalism is their setting a certain standard, usually lower, for another person's behavior. They are setting a standard against setting a standard. So we have one Christian who says, I believe that we are saved by grace and not works, and to me, the standard of righteous behavior is obedience to God's word. And the reply from another Christian is this, I believe we are saved by grace and not by works, but to me, the standard of righteous behavior is not obeying God's word, because that would be legalism. Sounds confusing? It should. Think about it. One person's excuse for obeying God's word is because they love him, and another person's excuse for disobeying him is because they love him. Let us look more closely at the concepts of salvation and righteous behavior. We have already established that the standards of righteous behavior for the Christian must come only from God's word and cannot come from what each person may deem right in his own mind or what he thinks he hears in the spirit. Therefore, God's law is is the standard for right and wrong. And mankind has proven over and over that he will not hold to that standard. And, as such, he cannot make himself righteous or become righteous by working the works of God's law. Only failure and frustration await the one who would attempt obeying the law to gain salvation. But if that law is not the standard by which we are judged, then why would Jesus have to die for us? The entire concept of Christianity must rest upon a righteous standard of behavior established by a righteous God. Anything otherwise negates any reason for Jesus' death on the cross. Therefore, Romans 10, 9-10 states that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Certainly, there is nothing about working our way into salvation there, and it is clear our righteousness comes only from believing in Jesus' righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8-10 through speaks with even more preciseness regarding our salvation through faith and not works, but adds a charge to that truth that is a result of that salvation. Listen carefully to the words that describe not only our salvation by faith alone, but what is to be our response to that salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, adamantly, we are saved by grace alone and never by our own works. We are new creatures created in Christ Jesus. But for what are we created? For good works, 
not for avoiding good works because we or someone else may brand us legalistic, not to walk as close to compromise as we can so we may appear to be accepting and tolerant of the world, we are to be neither, and not doing the actions we judge to be good works. It is only God who can tell us what his good works are. We have already established that we cannot do so because man has shown, and we as individuals have shown, that we will rationalize the most vile atrocities as what is right in our own eyes. And I certainly will label as good any charitable, kindly, or churchly act that may feed the bottomless pit of my disguised ego and pride. Therefore, we must have only one standard of what is good, and that can only be God's opinion, which is his word. And if we are saved for good works, and those good works are defined in God's word, then how dare we fear or label as legalistic the very things which do show us to be followers of Jesus and markedly different from the world. If the same spirit of persecution of believers of the first century was operating in the United States today, the Colosseum would run out of victims after the first weekend. How would they know whom to persecute? The church now has the world's entertainment, the world's music, the world's methods, the world's words, the world's prophets and teachers, the world's books, the world's philosophies, the world's counselors, the world's morals, all having been made much more palatable by an inability to confront evil created by the fear of appearing legalistic. In fact, we have begun to work harder at not appearing legalistic than in any pursuit of appearing righteous. The Lord tells us we are to seek first his righteousness, not first seek to appear free from legalism. Righteousness is right with God, doing things his way, not ours. Romans 6.16 states, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness? It is obedience that results in righteousness, not our attempts to escape it. It is not to gain salvation from God that we owe him righteousness, but rather it is that we owe God righteousness because we have gained salvation from him. While some may say obedience is legalism and is attempting to work your way into the kingdom of heaven, the counter is that obedience is actually the kingdom of heaven working its way into you. In scripture, we only see righteousness and sin, not righteousness, sin, and legalism. The Garden of Eden did not contain the tree of knowledge of good and evil and legalism. God's good works, what he views as righteous, are not legalistic, but holy and just, to be embraced as the reason and result for our salvation, not shunned for fear of appearing too righteous. For while we cannot be made righteous by obeying the law, we are certainly made unrighteous by not obeying it. And it is when we fail to obey his law that we have entered the unrighteous. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, not for the sake of unrighteousness or compromise in the face of the fear of being too righteous. Scripture is constant in its call for us to err on the side of too much righteousness. How can there be such a thing? Rather than not enough righteousness. When Christ used as a standard the most legalistic men of his time, he said, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The compromised are never accused of legalism. Those that are attempting to fully embrace God's way and laws suffer the reviling word legalism, not those that embrace compromise to avoid earthly discomfort. And the greatest of those earthly discomforts is really at the base of this entire argument, the subjugation of our wills. This is the problem from Genesis to Revelation. Who is the creator and who is the created? Who is master and who is servant? Who is the no other God before me? And who is the object of loving with all our heart, soul, and might? It is interesting that these basic ideas involve a clash of wills. And that clash of wills is measured by the standard of one thing, obedience. Will it be obedience to me, my will, and my word? 
or obedience to God, his will, and his word. My obedience is not to prove who is righteous and who is not, but rather obedience is to prove who is God and who is not. In 1 Samuel 15, King Saul is doing something good. He is sacrificing to God. Well, it would have been good, but for one thing, he had to disobey God to do it. He was doing something which in his own eyes was good, but was not the way God had stated it should be done. The prophet Samuel then reminds us all that doing something for God, i.e. sacrificing ourselves, which we think is good, is not as important as simple obedience to God. To obey is better than sacrifice. Why is this so? The sacrificial laws of the Old Testament are very specific for good reason. If we didn't have specific instructions, our wills would dictate what or how much we sacrificed and relegate God to our creation rather than we his. And do not think such instructions are lacking in the New Testament. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men in such a way as to be noticed by them. Do not give, pray, or fast so as to be noticed by men. We as humans have not changed through the centuries. Sacrifice can involve what I want. Obedience only involves what God wants. Sacrifice involves giving something up. Obedience involves our will. Obedience is better than sacrifice because obedience is placing our will under his. So we see that often our sacrifices to the Lord are more precisely sacrifices to our egos presented in the temple of our own will. Our obedience to God is not to his word, his will, the very word testament means will, but is rather obedience to a feeling that we equate to being led by the Spirit. And it is amazing how quickly we may obey those feelings, even though they may be in direct violation of his word. I've heard a pastor say, I know what the Bible says about borrowing money, but that's not where I'm at. A woman we were counseling, when told that there was no scriptural grounds for the divorce she was planning, screamed, I don't believe that. And I know of a deacon board chairman, when asked by his pastor if they would handle a situation biblically, replied, the Bible doesn't work. The stories are endless. So in today's church doctrine, we have God's word opposing his will, and God's direction determined by an individual's abdominal pain. It has come to a point that we must feel we are led to obey any of the Lord's words. If we feel we are being led to obey, it won't be legalism, but we'll be honored as being led by the Spirit. And this is precisely where, again, legalism attacks obedience to God. Amazingly, we lay aside any pursuit of righteousness that we may not offend him by appearing legalistic. It sounds so good. God, I am resting in your righteousness, that I will no longer pursue righteousness, but will do only the right thing if I feel you are leading me to do it. If I obey your word, I might appear legalistic. So, I set that aside to be led only as I feel you lead me. While we do not hear these specific words, our heart and attitude scream them. Jesus Christ paid a most terrible price for our lack of obedience. The price of our lack of obedience was Christ's death. The price of Christ's death should be our obedience. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These are among the strongest words spoken to confront me at my perceived basis of power. The first perceived base of power is the spoken word. The belief that if I benevolently acknowledge with my mouth Jesus as Lord, the state of my obedience to his will is secondary to those words, when the opposite is the real truth. My doing his will is the only thing that will give substance to my calling him Lord. And the placement of professing before performing violates not only the letter— but the spirit of not using the Lord's name in a vain way and of bearing false witness of who we are to him and who he is to us. 
To call him Lord with our lips and disobey him with our life is as false a witness as can be borne to Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. We take the name Christian in vain when we call him Lord and do not listen to or obey his word or when we teach that his law has been nullified. The second base of power of me is that of busyness, doing God's work, working for the Lord in his name. It is interesting to observe that many of those that brand others as legalistic are the busiest doing for him or learning about him, but rarely learning him. And this is precisely the point Jesus makes here. Our works in his name are not what he is seeking from us. He wants me. I never knew you. The word used for new is the Greek word for knowing completely, or I never knew you came to observe you as having experienced me. So here is the judgment on us when we work so hard in his name and then are so bold as to tell God how much we have done for him. Depart from me. He then adds the final characteristic of the busy believers. You who practice lawlessness. The King James translates, ye that work iniquity. The picture he gives us is so striking, because as many of his teachings are, it is not as we would expect. He tells us these are so busy working for him, they never spend time with him. And then, while they call him Lord, Lord, they practice lawlessness. The Greek word here for lawlessness is anomia, a, without, and nomia, law, or not having, knowing, or acknowledging the law. In other words, he, Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God, equates not being known by him with not knowing or acknowledging the law. Depart from me. I never knew you, you who say there is no law. What a terrible frightening contrast to those that would tell us that we are free from the law, from those that would tell us not to be legal. Depart from me, I never knew you, you who say don't be legalistic. We in today's church have become so compromised with the world that we can no longer use God's law as a standard of righteousness not only because we can scarcely recognize it for lack of use, but also because we are so busy being free from it. We have had to invent a make-believe sin, legalism. We condemn the righteous for their righteousness and applaud the compromise as truly free in Christ. Romans 6, 15-16 What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to one whom you obey, either to sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Christ has set us free from sin, not free to sin. Legalism is never listed as a sin in scripture. It is one of those modern church sins. But the use of this term is a real sin, that of being judgmental. The real reason we want to set our own standard of righteousness is to justify ourselves. Therefore, when we call another person legalistic for their standard, we are attempting to justify our own standard and behavior, the very thing we are accusing the other person of doing. And Paul's words in Romans 2.1 ring true through all time. Every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. You who judge, practice the same thing. And here, I will finally add that I do understand that Scripture is very clear that obedience from the flesh is not desired by our Lord. But this book has been very clear that Scripture also tells us that keeping God's word in our heart through meditation changes the belief system, which changes outward behavior, all by His grace and the power of His Holy Spirit. But why bring this up in a book on relationship with God? We are to be in right relationship with God. My sin, iniquity, and transgression separate me from God, not my legalism. The fear of legalism has become an excuse for sin. That is inexcusable. 
put aside your Satan-bred fear of being too holy or appearing too good. We are to walk in the fear of the Lord, not in the fear of legalism. This concept of fearing righteousness is one of the biggest impediments ever designed by God's enemy to keep us from intimacy with our Heavenly Father and enslaved to the enemy of our soul.